Griffin's mother confessed to both he and his sister of a lengthy affair she had been having with a somewhat illustrious cartoonist known as Lawrence Lariar. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Lariar, yeah. And uh, Griffin's attempt to learn more about his mother's relationship and to come to terms with this revelation as well as uh, try to understand his parents better um, is the subject of his latest graphic novel, Invisible Ink, My Mother's Secret Love Affair with a Famous Cartoonist. And that will be the central topic of our panel today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome uh, join me in welcoming Bill Griffith here. So. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, so to start with, um, this is a slight uh, image you guys sent me um, from a 1974 issue of Young <coughs> Lust, the page you did, yes. where um, you are portraying an affair between a cartoonist and a uh, woman. Obviously, this is something that had been percolating in your head since you first learned of it, but at what point, what was, what was the point where you said, I have to tell this story, not just kind of come at it obliquely, but I have to directly tell my mother's story? Well, the trigger for it was a visit to my uncle. My uncle is my mother's brother and still alive at <clears throat> 91. Um, three and a half, four years ago, he, it's, this is in the book, uh, this is how the whole thing started. He sent me a letter hinting that he would like me to come visit. And I did. I thought, he's getting old. I'm not going to see him a lot in the future, and this is a good time to visit. I went down for a visit. In the course of the visit, one evening, his wife, my aunt, said, um, do you think your mother ever had an affair with Dash? She said a name. And I said, not too likely that he was our neighbor. But of course she did have a long affair with Lawrence Larrier. And both my uncle and my aunt said, who, what? <coughs> and I explained, and they were kind of okay with it. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I thought they were gonna be outraged. I mean, this, these are conservative people, um, but underneath all conservative people is a not so conservative person, and that came out. I went, I was staying at a hotel nearby. My aunt was very sick, so I didn't want to stay with them and bother her. So I went back to my hotel that night with this conversation in my head. And the book was born in about a four hour frenzy. I was up to like three in the morning, just scribbling notes, going online, looking up this guy who I, I had never researched him at all. I knew when I was a kid that my mother worked for him as a secretary, and that I knew he was a famous cartoonist, but I only had one meeting with him, um, which is in the book also. So my relationship to him was very slight, but when I did the research, I said, oh my God, this guy has done everything in comics from, he worked for the very first comic book, New Fun, in 1934. He had four daily strips. He wrote three how to do draw cartoon books. He wrote gag cartoons for every magazine from the 1920s to the 1970s. A huge career that's been completely forgotten. Anybody ever heard of Lawrence Larrier? Anybody? Not one, okay. If this was 1953, you would have all said, oh yeah, that guy. He was in Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, Look. All, he was a, primarily a gag cartoonist. But so this book just sort of blossomed out from that, that meeting with my, my uncle and my aunt. Had you ever entertained the possibility of trying to do that story beforehand? Well, as you showed f that strip yeah. from 1974, that was my one previous and only attempt. My mother confessed her affair to me, as was explained, um, right after my father died. He died in an accident. We're in the hospital. The doctor comes out, says, sorry, we couldn't save him. My mother turns to me and my sister and says, I have to tell you this now because I'll never tell you, be able to tell you again. I had a long, happy affair with a man you knew slightly, and she said his name. And my sister and I just looked at her like, what planet are we on? This is, we were in total shock. We weren't even grieving yet. It was just after he died. And so it just sort of stayed in the back of my head. And as with most kids of their parents, you don't ask questions. I could have asked any number of questions. She came out to live in San Francisco in 1980, partly because I was living there, and we became very close, and I, I, could, have, I could have asked her all sorts of things. I never did. 
But when she died, she pointed to a filing cabinet just the day before she died, and she said, throw everything away but that, keep that. So it took a while for me to examine that filing cabinet, but there were diaries, letters, a long, unpublished novel. She was a writer, all about the affair. So I had this huge trove of material to work with. Now, now you said the story pretty much came to you fully formed. Like, did it go through any kind of like revisions yes. or the voice oh, change yeah. at all? Well, the, then the structure has to happen. You know, you're writing a book, you have to worry about structure. I decided to not do it chronologically, but to weave in and out of the past and the present. So I have a kind of a narrative device in the book where I'm talking to my wife, cartoonist Diane Newman, and we, that happens every so many pages, so it kind of comes back to the present that way, and that goes back into the past. Um, and then I have a whole section where I, a what if section. What if he had been in my life as a father? What if my mother had divorced my father and married him? This was a, a cartoonist who taught comics, <laughs> who had a cartooning school, who asked my mother several times, should I mentor him? And she said, no, <laughs> please. This is, this is a 16 year secret affair conducted while she was married from Levittown, Long Island. The affair took place in the city in New York in a hotel, sometimes in motels, but usually in this one hotel on 43rd and Lexington. So 16 years. Did my father know? How could he not? But I have no evidence of it. Once again, he died before I could have asked him that, but. Well, I do, I do want to touch on that and that idea of family history and, and trying to learn about your parents. But um, one thing I wanted to touch on early is, you know, this isn't your first attempt at autobiography. It's not, uh, even though you're known primarily for Zippy, which has a healthy appreciation for Dadaism and the absurd, um, you even, uh, you have attempted to delve into your uh, family history yes, before. I have. Mm -hmm. um, and you even in the pages of Zippy, I believe, did a story about your relationship with your father and, your, uh, and how troubled that was. Um, yeah. Do you feel an affinity for this, for nonfiction, for, for, uh, um, for biography or autobiography? Well, and how does it differ from your approach well to you know, working on in, Zippy? Uh, in 19, what year? 19. I have to guess, 76. I'd been doing, doing Zippy for about six years in underground comics and in a weekly self-syndicated strip. And Art Spiegelman told me that he liked Zippy, but it was a little bit like being stuck in an elevator with a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> and by that, I took that he meant that I maybe should change things a little bit. And what I thought was, Okay, Zippy is a, an absurd comic character. Maybe he needs a partner who's his opposite. And I thought, well, that's me. I'm very opposite from him. Zippy is my inner weirdo, but I'm not that way. If I was that way, I couldn't drive or um, pay the rent. So, um, so I created Griffey. Griffey had been sort of there a little bit uh, before then. But I decided to make Griffey be Zippy's partner in comedy and ex exploring stuff. Once I did that, the leap from there to doing auto-bio material of Griffey as me seriously was a natural growth, outgrowth of that. So that's where that happened. Um, did you see uh, the book at all as any sort of I don't want. I don't want. I'm hesitant to use the word catharsis, but to any extent, was to to detail this book, to delve into it. Was there any kind of bibliotherapy uh, going on for you in, oh, oh in yeah. dealing such a personal effort? And to what extent oh. were you conscious of that oh. and and mm -hmm. deliberate about it? How could it not? Um, I'm here. I am bringing my mother back to life um, with the constant feeling that she was in the studio with me some of the time. I had a dream one night while I was halfway through the book, that's, it's in the book, where I came down to the studio and she was in a sleeping bag, sleeping on my drawing table. <laughs> and I tapped her on the shoulder and she said, oh, that was refreshing. Um, get back to work, see you later. So I took that as an approval. <laughs> I took that as a nod of approval from her. But yeah, sure, I mean, I had, um, 
I had moments where I just broke down crying while I was doing the book. Um, many moments like that. Well, that's kind of where I wanted to lead into with this because one of the really interesting things about this book for me is how you portray yourself throughout it. In that you're never, you, you're never coming at it from a point of anger or from a point of um, frustration or uh, there's a bit not not maybe resignation but maybe a, 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 a seemed to, uh, the main central desire here seems to be curiosity and a desire to understand mm -hmm. which I thought was an interesting approach I think another maybe even a lesser book would be more from a point of of a fr of, of maybe about your wounds or your hurts um, and you seem to studiously try to avoid that, although you're there, you're very much a present to the novel at the same time. So I wanted, I was, were you concerned at all when doing this story about how you portrayed your feelings uh, with your parents and how your feelings, any, especially any native feelings you might have about this story, might affect the narrative and get in the way, as it were? I don't think that ever happened. <laughs> I had the same attitude that my aunt expressed, very surprisingly, when she said, good for her, when she heard about the affair. My sister, on the other hand, has a very different feeling about it. When I showed the book to my sister, she looked at it and she said, we have very different ideas about our mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't go into that in great detail, but she, <laughs> she didn't have the same feeling of good for you at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, she felt that my mother had betrayed my father. Um, I don't feel that way. This is your first, this is being billed as your first, um, I'm using the quotes I think Fanographics used, the long form graphic story. Was the length of this project and the, and the ambition of it, was that a challenge for you in any way? And, you know, being known traditionally for a daily comic strip where it's a lot shorter, the gags are shorter? Well, if, no, because at first it felt like I was getting back to my underground days when I would do 10 page stories and 12 page stories. Um, and I felt like I'd been kind of damming up <laughs> that urge for years. Um, sometimes in Zippy I'll do what amounts to a, you know, a long continuing narrative that goes on for days and days. And if you read it all together, it is a narrative, a long narrative, but not the way a narrative feels when it's done specifically for the long form. In a daily strip narrative, you have to break it up. It has to feel self-contained. Every four panels has to feel like you could read it without knowing what happened before or after. Doing a long form graphic novel is exactly like writing a novel. Um, it requires a lot of concentration, a lot of thought about structure, continuity. I have incredible grateful feelings towards my wife Diane for being a really great editor. When I would bring the three pages up that I did that weekend and she would say, you know what, this page, there's a bump between this page and the, um, the next page. There's a there's a glitch, something is off, which I didn't see. Mm -hmm. Even at this point in my career, I'm, I teach comics and I teach kids about continuity and how everybody does things with continuity that make presumptions on the reader. You can never make a presumption in comics. You have to spell out what you're doing very carefully and clearly without being didactic. So that's a, a tightrope walk you have to do. And you need someone with an outside view to tell you when you've made a glitch when you've made a bump in the continuity. And so that was very different from my normal daily strip activity. But it, once I started doing it, it just flowed out. Um, I still had to do Zippy five days a week. I mean, five days a week, meaning seven strips. So this was all, all done on weekends. This entire book was done on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, about the difficulty of jug juggling a project, an ambitious project like this while you still have a daily job to, to, to do. Well, luckily, um, Zippy just um, rolls out of me every day. I get up about 9.30 and I go for a walk, about a mile, mile and a half walk. Inevitably, when I come home, I have at least one, if not three, strip ideas. <laughs> a walk literally jogs them out of my head, and I write them down while I'm walking, and I come home and I do either one or two zippy strips. And it's, it's a little bit like writing in my diary. It's that, it feels that um, easy for the most part. Once in a while, I'll sit at the drawing table and say, uh-oh, I have no idea. What's, what's next? Is it all over? But that lasts about 10 seconds. Um, Zippy and the other characters in the strip literally talk to me. Um, not in a schizophrenic way, but they talk to me. 
and they say, you know, it's time for me. I want to do a strip about me. I'm shelf life. You haven't done me in six months. <laughs> and so I, I just listened to that voice. Um, this would be also, I, I feel like it frequently plays upon this idea of kind of a, a lost America or a slipping America that's slipping away, especially in the kind of focus on kitsch iconography. Um, there was a run where you kind of focusing on, uh, you know, kind of the kitsch architecture of the 50s and 60s. And I think Invisible Ink ties into that, Alain. I think one of the ideas, one of the central themes of the book is this kind of idea of, a, of slipping away, of a lost generations of people. You, you mentioned not talking to your mother, not talking to your parents, and then you have this opportunity that you want to know more, and that opportunity is kind of gone. And mm -hmm. it, it seems like that's a, a central, even on a grander scale, that's kind of one of the themes of the book. Um, that there, there are there are even kind of memories, right, and right. And so there's this tension in the book between kind of the modern day and the yesteryear that's kind of that's that's lost. Mm -hmm. A recognition of the yesteryear is lost, especially in the even right away in the beginning in the opening page where you're kind of talking about how you don't get letters anymore. Yeah, you'll notice in the opening page at the bottom, I'm. I'm on my way to the post office and I'm worried about the list of things to be worried about and Donald Trump is one of them. And I, I wrote that three and a half years ago. And when I wrote it, I thought, gee, is he gonna be a figure of ridicule? Is he still gonna be around in a media sense in three and a half years? Thank you, Donald. Donald, Donald is a gift and not just there, but a gift to me every day as a cartoonist. You're, but it, is, that a, is that an important theme or issue for you, especially in working on that book, on this book, this idea of, um, you know, the uh, I was time very, lost? Yeah, I was very aware that I was kind of uh, not just dealing with the narrative of my mother's affair, but the times in which they took place. The, I don't think that affair could happen today in such a way. There's too much lack of privacy, too much exposure in the 1950s and 60s, um, you could still have secrets and do things in motel rooms and hotel rooms and not be caught. I think today it would be almost impossible, especially if your spouse was suspicious. Um, in those days, you would have to hire a detective if you wanted to investigate that kind of stuff. But yes, the, um, I, I, I like to get lost in the past in my strip and in this book it was in, it was part of the appeal of the book was to kind of regenerate the times in which the narrative took place um, can you let's can you talk a little bit about the research you did because you kind of actually it's happening in the boy one thing that I'm fascinating is you kind of detail the research in the book as you're happening yeah when so. I when I started the book um, I just had my memory of my mother confessing this affair briefly to me in 1972 and um, I knew that there was stuff that she had left me in that filing cabinet, but I hadn't quite looked at it yet. So there's the first treasure trove. She, she left two diaries, one of which in which the affair was discussed. On the front of it, it says, to Bill and Nancy. Nancy's my sister. So she clearly, people ask me, did your mother, would she be embarrassed by this book? Well. Hard to say, but she definitely wanted me to know the story. And so I had that material. Then I started doing online research, which is, of course, wonderful. Go to Google Images or Bing Images anytime, now or whenever you want to. Put in the name Lawrence Larrier, L-A-R-I-A-R. You will see hundreds and hundreds of pages of images, interviews, bios, articles, a huge amount of material. While I was researching that, I noticed, uh, I came across something that said Syracuse University Library. That, that was the, the source for a particular article. So I called Syracuse University and I said, do you have the papers of Lawrence Larrier by any chance? And they said, yes. I said, has anybody ever asked for them before? She said, no, you're the first one. <laughs> <clears throat> he left them himself over a period of four or five years in the late 60s. I couldn't get why he did that. He has no connection that I know to the university. But I went up there and I spent a couple of days you know, looking through boxes with white gloves, original art, letters, scripts. He wrote scripts for early TV shows. This guy was, people think I'm prolific or, 
overachieving. This guy was 10 times that. He was, I can't imagine he had a minute to spare. He wrote 16 crime novels. That was how my mother connected to him. He put an, a want ad in the local paper, Levittown, you know, Newsday, wanted a part-time secretary for a writer, a crime writer, didn't say cartoonist. And my mother was a writer, an amateur, kind of at that point, just been published a little bit. And that was what she did. She, he would speak his novels, and she would transcribe them, and then she did all the grammar check. My mother was an incredible grammarian. When, when I used to be with her in San Francisco, we'd be driving somewhere. If she saw a store sign with an apostrophe in the wrong place, she would say, Bill, let me get out. And she would go in, and she would tell them, you made a mistake on your store sign. <laughs> And they would look at her with a big eye roll, and then she would go on to the next door. Um, she, was a, she was a very skilled writer, and she knew grammar left and right, and syntax and all that stuff. So um, anyway, so yes, I, so I researched Elaria. Um, I went on, I mean, if, without the internet, this would have been much more <laughs> difficult. I bought every single book that he ever either did or edited, Dozens and dozens of books. He wrote three best-selling how to draw cartoon books, including one that was in my house. That's the other thing. See, this guy was my shadow father, in effect. My mother and my father's relationship was strictly mechanical. In fact, in her diary, she talks about how her sex with my father was strictly, she uses the word mechanical. I was happy to actually hear that they had sex, um, for my father's sake, at least. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> the, um, what, was I, what was I saying? Um, about your mother's diary uh, and Larry Ayer being your shadow father. Shadow father, okay, lost that. Okay, so this guy, okay. My father was a very smart man, he was well-read, did not graduate college, but he was, he was not a dummy at all. Um, but he had zero interest in art of any kind. Art, music, any creative effort, zero interest. Didn't look down on it, he just had no interest. Larrier was a cultured intellectual, a New York intellectual. <laughs> his, you would never guess it from his comics, which were strictly Bafo gags, guys and gals, you know, um, real lowbrow actually. His stuff. I, I don't. I can't say I really love his comics very much. I like his crime writing a lot. He's a great crime novelist. But Larrier, in effect, introduced my mother to a whole world of art, music, and culture through him. They didn't just have a hot sheet affair. They would go to gallery shows, museums. Broadway plays, movies, and all this stuff filtered into my house through, from Larrier, through my mother, to me. I didn't know, I didn't say, hey mom, how come there's a Picasso book in the house? It was just there, and it was there because of him. And I poured over it, and I got wrapped up in the whole world of art, and comics, both, through him, without knowing that that was happening. Um. <laughs> Well, let's talk a bit about Larry Art, because uh, one, one thing I found interesting that you told me was that you redrew all of his art for this <laughs> yes. book. You did not just simply reproduce it. Why? Mm -hmm. what was, why was that important? Uh, it was an instinctual feeling, and I, uh, my best way to explain it is I wanted to feel that the book was all by my hand, every inch of it. And the idea of, since I was going to refer to and show his work at all kinds of stages of the book along the way as I discovered it. If it was to be reproduced from the original source, just photographed and dropped in, it would be jarring graphically. Mm -hmm. I, I faithfully reproduced everything he did. I didn't try to make it look like my version of his stuff, but I thought I had to redraw it to, to feel that the book had a cohesive graphic feel. I also felt <laughs> that I was possessing it that way, I have to admit, that I was owning it in a way. And that also, and way in the back of my head, I thought, 
do I have to get permission to do this? <laughs> I asked Gary Groth, my publisher, he looked into it, he said, no, you don't have permission. Don't need, do not need permission, this is a legitimate research material use. But um, I just thought if I used his actual artwork, you know, he did, he did uh, covers, he did entire books of comics, all his own. If you look through the book, you'll see his output is enormous. And I felt I had to show it because that's really who he is. Well, but, you know. well, that's one of the fascinating things for me is not just, I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of an enigma to the extent that we know, we know who, what he did, we know his accomplishments, but as a person, um, he's sort of an enigmatic figure, perhaps only portrayed through the novel that your, that your mother, the semi-autobiographical novel your mom wrote. Um, and what's fascinating to me is, uh, to, to an extent, about this character is not just that he did so much, but that he is such a character. He's someone that you know, maybe a whole, like maybe three or four people in the in the, in the room know. And why? I mean. Why do you think that is? Why, what, is it just the vagaries of, of time? Is it just it's, that he represented an era that we just don't value ephemeral anymore? Ephemeral pop culture. No one likes to think of the present as ephemeral, but it is, just the, in the same way the past was. The, the number of cartoonists that we are kind of allowed to remember is limited. There were thousands, that, like Larrier, that we don't know about in many cases for good reasons. Larry was not somebody you want to sit down with and read 40, 50 years later. Right. His, like I say, his crime novels hold up. They're in the, in the um, Raymond Chandler tradition. They're wonderful. They're a little bit uh, pulpy, a little bit over the top pulpy, but that's good, I like that. <laughs> but his comics, he did four daily strips. One of them ran for four years. It's terrible strips. <laughs> Um, only one of them did he draw, by the way, he wrote the others. They were done totally cynically, which is why they failed. I have all the materials from the publisher of those strips, all the promotional materials, a lot of correspondence that he wrote. These were calculated strips to, okay, um, Milton Kniff does Terry and the Pirates, and I'm going to do you know, Irving and the Pirates, whatever. He just, he just decided to do stuff that he thought would make would be popular and make money. And his, and he, my mother inherited some of this. My mother always used to say when she was doing writing that I, I would say, what, you know, what's behind your desire to, she would do all kinds of odd things, articles for Cowboy Magazine and a Cat Lover Magazine. And I see you're jumping all over, over the place. What, what's up with that? And she said, uh, it's all about the money. I want to be paid. If you're not paid for your work, it's, you're not validated. It's not real. You're just you know, jerking off somewhere. You have to do the work, get paid, have a check. So wherever they will accept me, I will go. That's exactly Larrier's philosophy. He was after a, a paycheck. He was after a, a, a making a buck. And that's why he did what he did. So there's no, <laughs> there's no auteur. There's a little bit of a little bit of an auteur that sneaks into his crime novels, but in his comics, nothing. Mm -hmm. a Daily Strip for four years about a a writer of a what is it? I can't remember anymore. Um, the main character in the book was a romance writer who can't have can't get a girlfriend, and he has a leprechaun appear to him and tell him to do stuff. And it's just so, you're reading and saying, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's the most, it's like much more obscure than any underground comic I ever did. It's bizarre. <laughs> and it goes on for four years. And there's that great sequence in the book where you kind of have this almost kind of, I wouldn't call it a panic, but the panic attack, but this fear that like, what would you have, what kind of a cartoonist would you have been if he had had more of an influence on you? <laughs> yes, and you're kind of imagining yourself drawing Zippy the Pinhead in this kind of way. Yes, I, well, don't, I don't have a slide of it, but. You know, Larrier, um, like I say, he wrote three cartooning books. His approach to cartooning was the same as his approach to everything. It was like, um, make a buck, you know, do what they want, get it out there, don't be, too arty about it. So in the book, I imagine if he had indeed mentored me, as he suggested, 
This when I by the way, this is my I know this from her my mother's novel. My mother wrote a 384 page novel about a family saga going back from her parent her parents into her life all the way up into the late 1960s. I'm the only character in the family not in the book, which I wonder about. I kind of am grateful. <laughs> My sister comes off a little bit complicated. Um, Larrier has two chapters. He's named Maurice Greenwood. By the way, when I get to it, which will be in a week or so, I'm going to make this available on Create Space on Amazon, so you can actually buy the novel. It'll be whatever, 590, some low price. Just a simple. I'm just going to scan all the uh, typewritten pages of the book. And for total completists who want to see what it is, you can see it. And I, my, my mother would be, this occurred to me about two weeks ago, and it was like almost like my mother talking to me again. She's saying, okay, you did this book, Bill. Good for you, but what do I, what do I get out of it? <laughs> well, in the, in the book, you, there's several sequences. As a matter of fact, there's a very lengthy sequence where you pretty much um, on, uh, um, ha have lengthy segments from the novel. Um, and from and lengthy segments from her diaries, um, you know, mm -hmm. throughout. Yeah. How 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 important was to, to you to get that to have that direct, unfiltered voice? Okay, there's. Um, I've read, I've read my book about a dozen times. Um, every time I come to, whatever page it is, um, it's about three quarters of the way through the book. About three quarters of the way through writing the book. I discovered in the back of one of the diaries a sheaf of yellowed newsprint, which I hadn't seen before. I pulled it out. It's typewritten, and it's a detailed confession of her affair. Not in a diary entry, just in a kind of stream of consciousness writing. It actually starts out stream of consciousness, then it becomes very comprehensible, because she was a writer, and it talks about her dilemma after my father died, what should I do now? Will Larrier marry me? Should I ask him? She has another guy coming after her, uh, which she, who she married, unfortunately. Um, Larrier did not want to marry her. Okay, but anyway, this whole thing um, came, came to me. When I get to that point, when I'm reading my own book, I stop being analytical about my own work, and it's my mother speaking loudly. It's a whole section of the book. It's facsimile reproduction of these pages, every single word. And when you read that, that's my mother speaking absolutely directly to you. Not through me, not through comics, just absolutely directly. And every time I read it, it's just a powerful thing to me. Um, and I feel like she's right there with me. Um, so. Well, was it, were there um, other, you know, you talk about having her there and you talk about the, um, the, how emotional it was for you, but I was wondering, like, you're also, you know, you're drawing her having an affair, you're drawing, was there an, any feeling of embarrassment oh, yes. or awkwardness? Oh, yes. Because you're very, I mean, you're very, you know, you're a gentleman's cartoonist in the book, but are you, are, were, you were you concerned about that? And was it awkward, hard for you at times? Yes, I was. Um, I knew there was going to be the point, and I kind of knew when it was going to happen, when I would have to show sex. And to not do it would have been dishonest and weird. But um, <laughs> squirming and wigglingly, I did. Um, you have to, you know, drawing your mother having sex. Um, I did it, 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 there are two scenes in the book like that. Um, it was very hard, but it really, it, it, I didn't have to redo it a lot, it just happened. I decided to use silhouettes, <laughs> uh, somewhat silhouettes. Actually, there's three sex scenes in the book. One is silhouettes. And in my mother's novel, she has graphic sex. It's not, you know, pornographic, it's just sex, you know, and, but she's got orgasms and everything going on, and I had to do it too. I had to do it, and she gave me all the information. She gave me, like I say, the book goes back and forth between my assumption, my surmise of what was happening between them, to literally 
the word for word descriptions from her novel in which all the characters had different names, but they were all clearly who they were. I, I had, being her son, I had no problem. I knew, I knew who every single character was. She had, in her novel, the affairs took place in her aunt's house in Brooklyn. And I knew just where that was, and I'd show it in the book. It was on Hendrick Street in East New York in Brooklyn. Um, in reality, I had, a, I had one great interview with my old high school girlfriend just before she died. She was dying of ovarian cancer when I was talking to her. And I'd been putting off this phone call for a long time, but I called her and I said, Barbara, I'm doing this book on my mother. And can you tell me anything about her affair? Because when I broke up with my high school girlfriend, she became best friends with my mother for the rest of her life. They even were roommates for a time. So I figured, <laughs> this was a very uncomfortable phone call, um, but I had to do it. And she said, yes, I can tell you, they had a hotel, the Shelton Hotel on 43rd and Lexington, and your mother would come into the city and they would have their affair and they would have dinner, and then she would come visit me and sometimes stay overnight, and that was her excuse to my father that she was staying overnight with her friend, my former girlfriend. <laughs> so I got all kinds of information out of the oddest source of all. Um, and that I put in the book too. I, I locate their affair in the Shelton Hotel. The Shelton Hotel, by the way, I researched that. Georgia O'Keeffe used to live there. It, was a, it became kind of an artist's hotel, but it was founded originally as what they called a gentleman's hotel code word for where you can bring your secretary for an affair, okay? It was rooms, just rooms, and it was all men, and it opened up in the late 1920s. I imagine Larrier had relationships there before, with, before my mother. During their entire 16-year affair, though, they were completely monogamous which, with each other, and I have many, many sources to back that up. Um, so, I found out all kinds of stuff through research that I went, wound up in the book. I wanted to make the book feel that it took place in the real world and that it was not made up, even though some of it is my imagining, but that everything has a reason. Well, that's very, that brings me to the, my next question I want to ask, which, because the book has a very, you're very meticulous in your art and providing a sense of place. And I can tell that's something that's very important to you. Um, an example being the page I have up where you're, you know, show kind of the, the overly graffitied subways of the 1970s yeah. and to, to, important to get that sense of, of time and place. You're also, even in Zippy itself, I, I always feel like you have a really strong uh, se uh, sense of architecture and buildings. Mm -hmm. is, is that something that interests you? Or is, you know, obviously for this book, it was important for you. But I, in a general sense, is it important it, for you it as always, well? It always has. Um, I can't. It, uh, when I try to think of where it started, when I was in my, when I was about 14, and I would visit um, Cape Cod, one day I decided to draw the front view of all the houses on the street where I was, and then walk up to the front door and said, look, I just drew your house, it's $10. <laughs> uh, that's where I kind of, <laughs> that's where it starts for me. Um, but why? God, who knows. Um, I, like, I like specificity, specificity, which is of course the key to um, storytelling. The, 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 the more generalized you are, the, least, the less interesting the less involving. The more specific, the more interesting. The more specific, the better. The most specific, the better. The more detailed, the better. Um, so when I draw stuff, I like to use reference material and draw things as they really look now or looked at the time when the piece takes place. And I've always liked that. I used to collect postcards, and I still use them for reference. I don't collect them anymore, but I have thousands and thousands of postcards of mostly buildings and main streets and amusement parks, and, um, and I, I refer to them quite often. Um, 
getting back to the, the kind of the themes of the book, I mean, you kind of talk, you touched early on in our discussion about the idea of kind of a lost opportunity. And I feel like that <laughs> if, there's, if there's a really overarching theme to the book, it hinges on that at this. And I think it's why the character, why your Uncle Bill is such an important character. Uh, oh, sorry, Al, yeah. apologize. Um, I, Al is such an important character to yes. this book and why you open and close with him because I feel like if, if there's a if there's a, I don't want to say a message because this is not a messagey book but if there's a, the important theme it's don't lose touch know your parents ask questions find out yeah. who they are don't lose touch with that connection you have to the past line and even go there's a find it here you know you talk early on about one of your um, ancestors William Henry Jackson who was a famous, um, for, uh, you know, the father of the American picture postcard. Yeah. And, you know, the, that, that there's this central theme of it's important to know who, where you came from in a genealogical sense, that, that, that this matters, and that if you lose touch with this, that, that something, something, uh, something, you're yeah. losing something important. And, and that your parents are real people. Um, Roz Chess gave me a wonderful blurb on the back cover about, you know, we don't see our parents as real people. And that stops us from asking questions sometimes. It stops us from having discussions with them, especially when you're, we're younger. If you're lucky and you live long enough and your parents live long enough, sometimes that barrier comes down. But an effort has to be made, and usually has to be made by the child to the parent. Um, I didn't do that. And luckily, my mother left me all that material because otherwise I would, this, would all, this book never would have happened. Um, and yes, the, um, the book opens and closes. The book is sandwiched between two visits to my uncle. When I first visit him, and in effect the book is, is born of that visit, and then the book goes through the whole story of the relationship and who Larry is and how he affected me and my father, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, I'm, I was actually thinking, as the book was winding down, I'm thinking, how am I gonna end this? There's so many ways to end this which is the right one, and uh, the phone rings. And my uncle says, um, my aunt died. Nell, Nell died, her name was Nell. Um, and I said, well, I'll be down there for the funeral, what, when is it? And I went down for the funeral, and that was the end of my book. I had that trip to sandwich from the first trip to the, to the end of the book, I had those two things, those two, in a way, I mean, they weren't devices because I, I didn't do it as a writer. I, it just happened that way. And when I went down to visit my uncle last year, whenever it was, um, <clears throat> and we, we, after the funeral, we had another long talk and I'm in the room, his room, he's, he had, he's a ham radio operator. <laughs> This guy still has a ham radio with all the tubes. It's like going into the 1950s to walk into his little ham radio room. This is a guy who drew, he was a draftsman for Western Electric. He drew the electrical systems for the Nike missile. And when I asked him about that, I said, what do you mean, you, did you create it? Or did you just do what someone told you? He said, no, I had to, I had to, make, I had to figure it out. This is before, um, uh, printed circuits, so everything had to be boxes and wires. Okay, so this is a guy that's, he also left me all of his drafting supplies, by the way, on, on that trip, which is wonderful, but. We're in the room with this ham radio, and I'd been there before, but I never had been quite sitting where I sat, and I looked up in the closet behind him, and there's all these boxes of letters that looked very old. And I said, what are, what are those, Alan? He said, I don't, he said, I don't know. My father left them to me. I never opened them. So I said, do you mind if I <laughs> take a look? And there's three big, big boxes of thousands of letters. One box is entirely letters that he wrote to his parents and that his parents wrote to him during World War II when he was overseas. He was totally shocked. He'd never seen them before. <laughs> Another box was all of his father's attempts to exploit William Henry Jackson's name. <laughs> TV deals, movie deals, book deals. He was constantly trying to exploit his father's name. That was fun, interesting, but not. Then the third book, the third box, there's letters from my mother and my father to him. 
before they were married and when they were just married. And my father was a completely different person. I, I was reading these letters. He was like this optimistic, happy guy. I, and I thought, well, <laughs> the picture I've given in the book of my father is not full. It's not a full picture. Here's, here's the rest of it. And so that's how the book ends. Um, the book really is the story of a marriage. I don't think of it really as the story of an affair. <laughs> it certainly is. That's the structure of it. But it's also it's the story of a marriage, and a very complicated, in many ways unhappy marriage. But when I found these letters at, uh, in my last visit, it was like a full circle feeling for my. I, I felt like I had done more justice to him, to my father, by using them in the book. If you read it, you'll see I, I use the letters. Um, I want to take some time for questions, but first I wanted to ask you, um, that we are now segueing a kind of awkward segue. Uh, next year is going to be Zippy's 30th year of daily syndication. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, qu that's quite an achievement. How's your, how's your approach to the strip changed over the years? Has it at all? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel it's not a conscious thing on my part, but I feel like every, God, I don't know, five, seven years, I kind of reinvent the strip. And it doesn't happen consciously. I don't say, time to reinvent my strip. Uh, you know, in the year 2007, so I'm, I'm about due for another one. In the year 2007, I suddenly thought, um, what if there was a town in which all the people were like Zippy? And what would that do to various storylines? And would it open up the strip? Yeah, I think it would. So I'll try that. So I created Dingberg. Dingberg, of course, with a nod to Duckburg, to, to Disney, to, to Scrooge and Donald. Um, and I'm kind of winding that down now. And I don't know quite what the next step is going to be. But every so often, I feel like I just, I just breathe some new life into it so that I'm interested so right. that I'm not repeating myself. And I hope I can do that again. It could be soon. It, um, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon, but of course, you know, I'm not getting any younger, so. Well, why don't we uh, just uh, end and then we'll take some questions. Um, tell me a little bit about the project you're working on now. Well, when, when I finished my book, I took a break, obviously, and um, a breather. But within a couple of months, <laughs> I missed doing the book. I missed that, that feeling of doing a long narrative. Um, and so I thought, okay, is there another book? That took about another month, many walks in the morning, and it came to me that I should do the biography of Schlitzie the Pinhead, who is the major inspiration for Zippy. If you've seen the 1932 Todd Browning movie Freaks, you've seen Schlitzie. Schlitzie has one scene in that movie where he, it's hard to hear what he's saying. He's um, b sort of blurry, but um, I started researching Schlitzie. I actually found two people who knew him well. His last um, manager, he worked in circus sideshows right up until the, uh, about a year before he died in 1971. Wow. And I found a man who had spent an entire summer with him in Toronto in a circus, living next door to him and kind of taking care of him. And I got wonderful stories. Um, the, the idea is to make, let's see the pinhead be a human being, not a sideshow freak, but to try to bring him to life as a human. And I'm about 25 pages into it and I don't know, it'll keep going. It's, it's uh, loads of material and I'm very grateful to have two really wonderful um, direct sources to, um, to use for anecdotes. And you know, it's through detail that things come to life. So you can research something all you want, but if you don't have those moments when something comes alive, um, then your story can be very dull. And I'm, I'm trying to make Schlitzie into a, a real person. We don't have much time, but I think we can maybe get one or two questions in. 
Do we have a, if you have a question, just walk up to the microphone in the center. Yes. Hi, uh, I should mention my name is Nell, so it's Hi. nice to hear about another Nell. Um, okay. First, uh, what is the title of your mother's novel? And second, as you were looking through Larrier's uh, archive, was there any kind of a flicker of a reference to your mother or, some, or an influence from her uh, that you could, that you could her, her, okay. her novel is called Departed Acts, and it's a line taken from an Emily Dickinson poem, which is reproduced in the book. Um, so, okay. uh, did I find any, any mention of Larrier? Uh, my mother in Larrier's papers, it's also in the book, that's a guess. There's one photograph of him with a big lipstick kiss on it. Uh -huh. So, I'm, I like to think that... <laughs> That's my, of course, remember, Larrier was married. He had two children. Oh. I haven't heard from them yet, by the way. <laughs> it's any day now. <laughs> um, one of them is on Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm not reaching out. You're not going to friend him anytime no, soon. No, 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 no. <laughs> who, who knows what they knew? Uh, they're going to find out. Um, but no, the only connection from him, from his papers, is what. I surmise to be maybe my mother's lipstick kiss on a photograph. But Thank you. Nothing. And this was very touching. Thank you so much. Thanks. You've often comment on, commented on the difference between high and low art. Has doing the long form uh, graphic novel here changed your thinking about that, deepened it, or uh, altered it in any way? I, I, um, I like to. <laughs> The, the high art, low art distinction to me is irrelevant. I, I, I recognize it, and I see it all over the place. Um, but it's, it's it, the kind of comics that we're doing, people in this room and, and this SPX, are eroding the whole idea that there's this line between you know, comics, and, um, comics and, and painting, or comics and... Uh, you know, graphic novels and, and real novels, you know, that line is getting broken and blurred, and I think that's all to the good, because uh, why make a distinction? It's all art. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Last question. Okay. Um, a question about fiction versus nonfiction. I'm, I'm really excited to see you doing longer stories again, but I think I'm surprised that there are these nonfiction research-heavy projects when that's not what I think of your older work. So. Is that new for you? Is it interesting? Do you think you would do long fiction too? How does well, that feel? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I enjoy research. <laughs> and I didn't really think of the book as nonfiction. I thought of it as just a story that I had to do. I didn't say to myself, this is nonfiction. It's not like, it's not fiction. Um, and of course, when I read my mother's novel, that was fiction. So I fiction got, got, got into it in that way. but. Um, and the, and the Schlitzie book is going to be, I guess, nonfiction too. But you know, you have the right as a um, as an artist, as a cartoonist, to invent scenes and events and people in a nonfiction structure that are in effect are are fictionalized. That's that's allowable. <laughs> that's allowable. So I, I think mixing the both is actually a pretty good, pretty good idea. And with that, I think we're done for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffith, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.